Can I have your attention, please? We're going to get started with our keynote. So if everyone could get a space. Thank you. And I have the great honor of introducing Mai Yang from the Department of Education, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Thank you. All right, good morning. Hello. That's good morning in Hmong. Um, and happy Friday. So welcome to the 2021 Mel Ed Conference. My name is Mai Tong Yang. I'm an education specialist at the Minnesota Department of Education. And it is my honor of introducing our phenomenal keynote speaker today. Um, and I'll keep this short um, so she can get up here. But you know, oftentimes when someone makes an impression on you, you'd kind of think that uh, you'd remember that, that meeting or that time that they um, made that impression on you, right? Well, I think I certainly remember the first time that I heard her speak in person, um, although some details may be a little bit blurry because it's been a few years. Um, but it was in 2010, and I was a freshman in college attending my first semester at the University of Minnesota in my Psych 1001 class at Wiley Hall. And I believe Kalkalia came to read an excerpt of her book. And that day in that hall, I cried in a room full of 18-year-old strangers. And I cried because, um, you know, it was such, her experience that she was re retelling in that story was such a parallel to my own as a refugee and immigrant child. Um, and it was so similar, but also so different. You know, and in my humble opinion, what's so special about the way that she writes, at least to me, is how she manages to capture the joy in the Hmong experience. Um, and I think you'll be able to experience a little bit of that today as she speaks on memory and how it influences her writing. Um, so please welcome the fabulous Kalkilia Yang to the podium. I'm very comfortable on a box now. Um, <laughs> But thank you, Mai Tong, for that beautiful introduction. Hello, everybody. Usually, um, around this time of the year, I start gearing up for the Hmong New Year right here at the River Center. Last year, we didn't have a new year. This year, I don't think we'll have one as well. And so you all are my community. You are my celebration this year. So I'm delighted to be here. I think there is no better way to meet an author than with with their words. So I, I tend to believe, and I, I completely, um, I practice this in my classes. I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes while I read to you from my brand new children's book, From the Tops of the Trees. Illustrations are by Rachel Wada, and you won't get to see it today. But I think this speaks to the power of memory. This book came out in October. I have carried it inside my heart for the last 36 years. It is a real story from my life. It is a story that has fortified my heart across the hard seasons. It emerged because I was telling my kids a story, just a random, regular, fictional story. And they said, Mommy, where were you when you were our age? And I started talking about Ban Vinai refugee camp. I started talking about when I was four and five and six. And I found myself climbing the tops of the trees in my father's arms after I was done. My daughter, who's eight, looked at me and said, oh, mommy, that's where you were because it was so long ago. It was so far away. And I started thinking about how we live in a world that is making more and more refugees all the time. I started thinking about how the life I live is so many lives around the world right now, today. And so I knew then that I had a bigger responsibility to carry the story outside of my heart and this language that has been a shelter for me, a sanctuary across the different seasons of my life. Like my tongue, I was born in the Hmong language. Hmong is my first language, but English is the working language. 
of my life. It is a language where I get things done in. It is a language where I translate the arms, the invisible arms holding me high right here, right now, so you all can see. The old woman, Zhuo Li, who never learned how to read or write, my grandmother, who had never been in a classroom, whose biggest fear was that she would be forgotten, the reason why I became a writer. Because she said, for somebody unable to read the written word, she would live and she would die and she would be forgotten. I'm here because of her hands and you can't see them, but if you could, you'd see how straight they were. Although they were old, all of my life with her, they were old, how straight and how strong, how carefully they touched the world, how closely they were a part of it. My grandma who spent her life as a farmer, her back to the sky, her front to the earth. My grandmother who taught me that wishing on the, on the stars that I was doing it all wrong in all of those moments of my youth when I despaired, when I wished my way into a different future, a different alternative. She told me, Menai, the stars are too high. That's why it didn't come true. If you want your wishes to come true, you send them on the airplanes. That means that they will be somewhere in the world waiting to be found. Life will take you there. My grandma, who on the hottest days of summer used to spread sugar on my tongue and put an ice cube because we couldn't afford the popsicles. She tell me, when we hear the ice cream truck singing its song from down the street, that is sweet and cold coming together in the mouth of a child. You don't have to watch other people and swallow that sweet and cold coming together. It is my grandma who stands here with me today in the heart of me. She makes me stronger for this world, a world in which she has been rendered invisible in so many ways. And so at this point, I'm gonna ask you all to close your eyes and go on a journey with me to the tops of the trees, okay? We live in a world where we don't get many opportunities to close our eyes, so I'm always trying to build them in. This is my dedication. For the loving arms that hold us high so we can see beyond the fences of our worlds. This is Rachel's dedication. Tagalia, who has gone beyond the tops of the trees to share her story with the world. Banvi Nai Refugee Camp, Thailand, 1985. When the sun gets to the highest point in the sky, the leaves of our favorite tree become a great umbrella of cool for my cousins and me to play under. Hurry! Mai throws a ball of rice onto the ground and so races the chickens in the yard to get to it. A bald rooster with black tail feathers beats her. The look on her face is so sad and so hungry, the fun disappears. I wave the lion dog and the Jackie Chan dog close. I hold onto the lion dog's neck and climb on his back. I push my little legs into his sides and try not to fall when he starts to walk. I can feel myself slipping off his back, but I'm not afraid. My father catches me just in time. In his arms, he lifts me higher and higher. I squeal, my father says. When someone falls, you have to pick them up and lift them higher than they were before. After a night of heavy rain and wind, we wake to find pebbly fruit scattered on the ground. Beneath our tree, Nzao and I crouch low and look for the fruits that are still good enough to eat. We know that if we eat too many, we'll get stomach aches and our mothers will be mad. If we eat only one or two, we can pretend we're eating hard candy and it is a very special treat. In the quiet, we can hear the aunties talking about the war as they sow. They talk to each other about the river they had to cross to get to Thailand. They talk to each other about how Thailand wants Hmong refugees to leave their country. They're scared to return to the old country. They're scared to go to a new country. The adults talk of war, and they get scared all over again, as if the war was not yet over. That afternoon, I ask my father about the war, and he says, you're safe. He takes one of my small hands in his big one and tells me, look at your hand. He points down at the tips of my toes and says, look at your feet. He says, your hands and your feet will travel far to find peace. 
His eyes are as serious as his words, so I say, yes, they will. It is rations day. Every week, a big truck comes into the empty space in the middle where we live. Thai soldiers give each family enough food for three days. They tell us they're practicing a humane deterrence policy so that no more Hmong people come into the country. I don't know what they're talking about, but I do what the adults around me do, and I nod my head like I understand. That evening, before my bath, I looked down into the cement well, and I asked my father why we live behind a gate. I want to know why other people can come in, but we can't leave. He says, we live in a refugee camp, a place to hold people who are running away from wars. I ask, Father, is all of the world a refugee camp? No, he says. What is the world outside this camp like, I ask. My father has no answers for me. The next day, as Mai and Zoe and I play beneath our tree, my father walks to where my mother and auntie sit sewing. I hear him say, Ju, can you put Galia in her nice dress and her hat? My mother never allows me to wear them except for pictures. They lower their voices. Finally, my mother shakes her head, puts down her embroidery, and gets up. She waves her hand for me to follow her. In our small room where we sleep on a bamboo platform bed on a folded blanket, my mother opens the suitcase where she keeps our nice clothes. She takes out the dress and the hat. She takes out my father's nice shirt and pants. Mother helps me take off my everyday t-shirt and shorts. She wipes me down with the shirt and then tells me to raise my hands over my head. I feel, I feel the cool fabric of the dress fall over my skin. I feel myself growing more and more beautiful with each button she closes at my back. Mother combs my hair before placing the hat on my head. She looks at me carefully, then shakes her head once again and smiles. Outside, my father is waiting with a camera he's borrowed. When we come out, he puts the camera in my mother's hands. I'll change quickly, he says. In our fine clothes, my father takes me to the tallest tree in the camp. He tells me to close my eyes and to hold tight to his neck, to not let go, no matter what. My Enzo stand at the base of the tree, staring at us, hands over their mouths. Even the aunties in the shade take their eyes off the work in their hands to see what we're doing. I tremble a little as I feel my father climb up the tall tree. I hold as tight to him as I can, tighter than I have even held the lion dog or the Jackie Chan dog. I can feel my heart beating in my eyelids. At one point, my father slips a little and my mother yells from underneath, but I don't let go and I don't open my eyes. It is not until my father says, look, the world is bigger than this place, that I open my eyes. I'm higher than I have ever been. A breeze blows and the leaves shake and I shake with them. My father says, don't be afraid. I see sky, I see birds flying high. I look down at my mother on the ground. She's run far from the base of the tree back to the bamboo patio on stilts. There she holds the camera toward us. I see Zhao and Mai, the lion dog and the Jackie Chan dog, look up at us too, their tails wagging. They are all small and far away. I look from the houses we live in to the cement well, toward the open field where we get rations, then away from the camp itself, until I see the distant mountains rising at the place where the sky meets the earth. What is on the other side of those mountains? Another breeze blows, but I don't shake. Father, the world is so big, I say. My father answers, yes, it is. He says softly, one day my little girl will journey far into the world, to the places her father has never been. My father tells me to smile at the camera, but I can't, because I now know that the world is bigger than anything I had imagined. My little legs 
will have to carry me far. And you can't see it, but I want you to open your eyes. Um, this is the actual photo taken on that day. I was four years old when my father, in our very best clothing, took me to the tops of the tallest trees so that I might see a bigger world. My father, a Hmong man, who even today speaks English with a thick accent, who hesitates over his words, although he's an incredible song poet in the Hmong tradition, in English, his voice falters and sometimes it falls. I've lived most of my life in English. I was six and a half when we came to America. I remember being at Battle Creek Elementary School and a teacher looking down at me, and the teacher who I'll always remember because she had a shirt with a reindeer on it, and I'd never seen a reindeer before. <laughs> I remember how she looked at me and she said, say your ABCs. And I looked up at her and I said, A, B, and C. She said, no, no, say the whole thing. Say your ABCs. And I looked up at her and I said exactly A, B, and C. That was all I knew. That was what I came into English with. A, B, and C, the beginning of the alphabet. Three of my favorite, three of my absolute favorite, you know, letters still to this day. But I've come a long way. I've come a long way from that day. The story that I just read you is 36 years old. I'm 40. It just came out in October. Sometimes the great stories of our lives, even in the languages that we've learned how to walk in, how to run in, sometimes it still takes that long. I have so many memories of being in the St. Paul Public Schools I was a TESOL kid, and then I had English language learner classes. I would be taken out of my classrooms, and we'd go, and all we would do is tell stories. All we would do is point to letters and words and try to make the world perhaps a grander place than I knew it to be. All of those years, if somebody had said to me, Kalia, one day you are going to become a writer. If somebody had said to me, one day you are going to tell your stories in English for a bigger world. If somebody said to me, one day you're going to speak in a microphone so your words will be heard, will be understood, will be carried long after the meeting is done, I wouldn't have known how to believe them. And yet the words of my father, they've guided me in the work that I've done in English. My father, who in Banvinai refugee camp, carried me to the tops of the trees. But he who also said to me on all of those days when I knew my mother was hungry, when I knew my father was hungry. When they handed my sister and I the single egg, when they gave me the egg whites, because even in that place, I refused to eat the yolks because I didn't like them. When they handed me the egg whites and offered my sister the yolks, he'd always say, Menai, you are not a child of poverty. You are not a child of despair. You are hope being born, the captain to a more beautiful future, Menai. You are not poor because your heart is not a poor place. I remember being, being a teenager. We were all teenagers. We didn't have cable TV. We couldn't go to the theaters. To be normal, I pretended like I knew what a movie theater was like in school. When people talked about the movies, I nodded my head, just like I did in this book, like I understood, because I wanted to be normal so badly. Titanic was in the theater, and that particular day, my friends were going to go see it. Although we didn't have cable TV, every night on Entertainment Tonight at 6.30, there was a special on Leonardo DiCaprio. So I was madly in love. <laughs> I remember how I walked home that day, feeling only the weight of the books on my back. I remember how my heart boiled inside, and I wanted to let my father know to his face, look him in the eye in the American way, and tell him that this is not the life that I wanted for me, that I wanted something and that I wanted something better, something more. I remember how when I opened the door to our tiny little house on the east side of St. Paul, that 900 square feet home of rotting mold in winter time, how he was sitting on the couch tying his shoes, getting ready to go to work, safety toe boots at the factory, I walked right up to him, and I threw my book bag down, and I made such a loud noise that he looked up. 
And I told them, this is not the life that I want for me. I want something better. I want something more. I remember how his eyes, how I could feel, I could see the liquid filling up in them. And I thought he was going to cry. And I hadn't thought about what I would say after that declaration. So I, I remember thinking, oh my, what have you done? But my father blinked the tears away and he said to me, May I? I would choose you all over again if I could. And a long time ago, when you were flying up high, up high with the clouds in the sky, when you could see the course of rivers on the trajectory of mountains, you saw a young man and a young woman walking without shoes. You chose to come down to us. Life is going to teach you the strength of the human heart, not of its weakness or fragility. I had no words, nothing to say. I watched my father walk to the door, limping a little because at work he stood on cement all night long, trying to meet the quotas on the assembly lines. I remember the roar of the car, and I remember the years in between. When I sought out to become a writer, I was still a victim of the semicolon and other grammatical structures, despite the good work of my teachers. These were the facts. The programs that I thought I had a chance rejected me. But Columbia University, one of the Ivy Leagues of this nation, a school that I did not know how to dare dream of, from the refugee camps of Thailand or the housing projects in St. Paul, the falling down Section 8 houses of my youth, they accepted me and they called me on the day that we buried my grandmother when her journey began in the other life. I was a senior at Carleton College. I was there to become a doctor because like so many generations of immigrants and refugees, we are taught that we need doctors and lawyers to survive in this country. Doctors heal what is broken in the bodies we love. Lawyers protect the rights that we've never had enough of. I went to Carleton, the first in my family to go and sleep on a campus 40 minutes away from here. It felt to us like it was on the other side of the country. At Carleton, I was studying American studies, cross-cultural studies, women and gender studies, and I was on the pre-med track because I thought a good doctor had to be able to see the world from multiple disciplines. But of course, life is not quite what we think it's going to be. My grandmother takes a fall my senior year of college. She falls down in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota. This woman who had promised me in Bambinai refugee camp that she would never die because I had cried and cried because suicide was the number one cause of death in the place where I was born. Because all around me, if I close my eyes, I can still pull up the voices of the women and the girls, the men and the boys crying, why are you dying here? Why are you dying in this place that does not want you? Get up, get up so we can go home. Home was a story of the past. Home was some future we couldn't quite imagine. But in that place, I cried until my grandmother, the oldest person I knew, down to her single tooth, her last tooth standing. She said the final gift from her mom and dad. I cried until she promised me she would never die. But my senior year of college, right when I thought I was going to make her proud, my grandma takes a fall, and when I go to her and I tell her to get up, oh, sha, grandma, get up. She tells me I can't. You have to understand that before you, I had a mom and a dad, brothers and sisters, your grandfather, my most precious little girl. There were people who loved me before you. There is no Hmong land when you look at the map of a bigger world, but I'm going to climb this mountain in my heart, Hmong Mountain. I'm going to swing open the door to the house of my youth. Dinner will be ready. Everybody will be there. And when I walk through that door, they will ask, why are you so late in coming home? My senior year, I'm about to graduate. In my dreams, I'm already walking my grandmother through the ball spot at Carleton. I'm showing her Laird Hall. I'm showing her the science buildings. I'm showing her that for four years, her granddaughter survived in this place. But I knew that it wasn't going to happen. I couldn't cry for her to stay, so naturally I cried for her leaving. Where does it come from, this moment when a child decides that they will be someone in the world around us? When they decide that they will be brave and that they will try to live a life worthy of the lives that were lost? 
Because for every Hmong American who made it here, two others died so we could be here. A third were killed in the war with the Americans, another third slaughtered in the genocide of its aftermath. While Gao San Patat Lao, the leading communist paper, published, it is necessary to extirpate down to the root the Hmong minority for having helped the Americans in that secret war, that unnamed war, that invisible war that has brought so many of us here looking for belonging, looking for a place, a place where we might build a home where children like me could grow up and dare to dream. My grandmother dies. I've submitted applications. The University of Minnesota's MFA program where I now teach has rejected me. They, they knew it. I was a victim of the semicolon and other grammatical structures. But on the day my grandma dies, I pick up the phone because my roommate says I have to listen to these messages. And one of them was from Columbia University saying that they had accepted me. They had not only accepted me, they had given me their highest fellowship into writing. They would pay for half of my tuition. Half of a tuition is nothing when you have nothing. The second message was from the Paul and Daisy Searles Fellowship for New Americans, the biggest graduate fellowship in the land, usually given to students from Harvard and Stanford studying medicine and law, not small liberal arts colleges, not Hmong American girls dreaming of a pathway into writing. But the second message was from them, and they said, we'll pay for half of your tuition no matter where you go and give you a $20,000 living stipend a year. This all happened on the day we buried my grandmother. Big magic collides with a dream and a wish, and here I am before you. I have become a writer so that I can meet the people from the past who have tried to pull me along, whose only dream was that I would become their future. I'm here because I, I know what happens. Eventually, we all die. I'm 40. Maybe I get, if I'm very lucky, 40 more years to do good work. If there is enough earth space yet, maybe I go in the ground. If there isn't, maybe I go in the air. The, the ending of life is not the big surprise. The beauty of it is that we get to be explorers. We get to be adventurers. We get to look around the corner. We get to say to the generation coming that we were here and we believed. We believe in you. We believe in your possibility. I said yes to this talk today because I know how hard it's been the last 18 months. I know how hard it is on all of you, educators in our school. And I believe that one heart must lift the other. And so I came with a full heart to do a little, a little lifting, to tell you that your work matters and that it matters incredibly to lives like mine. That because of you, from the tops of the trees is in the world now. And for the author photo, my dad didn't know it, it was a surprise. There's a photo of us, not from the past, but from right now, right here. Because a story doesn't just belong to the person who carries it into the world. A story belongs to the people who enable that moment, that possibility. Long after my father is gone, I think that this picture will remain. Long after I'm gone, that this book will stand in the library for some other refugee child coming along who might one day dare themselves to be brave, who might one day find the words to speak of the stories that make them stronger, better for the world that we belong to. I live in words because there are limits. Because when people look at me, they see a short Asian woman with dark hair, with brown eyes, with tinted yellow skin. But through my words, I open up a world, the world not only inside my heart, but in the hearts of so many, not just within the Hmong community, but so many refugee communities all over, yearning for a home, traveling far in search of it. I'm gonna end my, my, my keynote with another small reading from my, my newest work for adults, Somewhere in the Unknown World, a collective refugee memoir. Um, and I'm gonna read from Afghani's story because we all know what happened in Afghanistan. We all know that in the next few months, some 800 Afghan individuals will be resettled into these cities and across our state. That the work we have to do is still always only beginning and that that is the one gift that life gives each and every single one of us. That our work is only a part of the beginning. 
Afghani drives a lift in these cities. During the day, Afghani works um, at a community college as an office manager. Afghani is only 30 years old. Afghani's hair is completely white. Uh, right before the explosions, the bombs went off at the Kabul airport. Afghani's mom and dad and brothers and sister were waiting there. They were hoping, they were hoping for a chance to come to America, a chance to escape the rule of the, of the Taliban. But that did not happen because those bombs went off. Just a month ago, Afghani's mother was stoned at a market called the mother of an infidel. So the story is very fresh and very alive. But somewhere in the unknown world began in 2016 when Donald J. Trump had just been elected president, when I could feel the winds shifting around, around me. It came out in 2020, right after Joe Biden's election, when there was a hope that perhaps those winds would settle and a warmer sun would, would warm us all. Dedication. For the refugees from everywhere, men, women, and children whose fates have been held by the interests of nations, whose rights have been contested and denied, whose thirst and hunger go unheeded and unseen. Opens with a poem by the great American poet, my favorite American poet, Lucille Clifton, quilting. Somewhere in the unknown world, a yellow-eyed woman sits with her daughter, quilting. Some otherwhere, alchemists mumble over pots, their chemistry stirs into science, their science freezes into stone. In the unknown world, the woman, threading together her need and her needle, nods toward the smiling girl. Remember, this will keep us warm. How does this poem end? Do the daughter's daughters quilt? Do the alchemists practice their tables? Do the worlds continue spinning away from each other forever? Afghani's story is called Certificate of Humanity. And that is not a title that I came up with, with for, um, for the piece. It is, it is the title that Afghani has given me. So I'll tell you a little bit of a backstory. Afghani is brilliant. By 19, he's graduated from university. USAID go and we say, do you want to help your country? And Afghani says, yes, I, I want to help my country. And so Afghani starts working with the US government. One day, Afghani and his mom are in the grocery store, and his cell phone rings. So Afghani picks it up, and it is the voice of a man, and the, the person says, I am the Taliban. You are wearing white. Your mother is wearing black. Who do we shoot first? And Afghani says, no, no, you have the wrong number. And the voice says, this is exactly what you did yesterday. This is exactly what you are going to do today. I have your whole schedule. Who should we shoot first? Afghani hangs up. These calls continue and continue until we get to a point where Afghani knows that if Afghani doesn't leave, Afghani will be killed. So I'm just going to read you a little bit from here, and then I'll skip around, because I've always believed that the power of the written word is not the information it delivers, but is the experience that it evokes and allows life in. So a special immigrant visa, SIV, right, offered through the State Department, takes an average of three years. Afghani knows he does not have three years. I made the decision to leave Afghanistan. I made arrangements with a human trafficker and was able to pay the price he demanded for taking me out of the country, $25,000 US. I tried to find a reputable trafficker, one who brought a contract for us to sign. The first line of the contract was a waiver. The trafficker was not responsible for my life or my death. They had no responsibility to return my body, alive or dead. Everything that happened to me on the road to probable survival depended on my following all of their instructions. Even then, they could not guarantee that I would make it out of Afghanistan. Other clauses in the contract said things like, they would divulge information only when it was necessary. The less I knew, the safer I would be. I signed the contract with a black pen. My mother and father hovered behind me. The trafficker averted his gaze sympathetically. On a bright day that I saw only through the filtered doorway of my home, a middle-aged man arrived at our house. He said, your son has 15 minutes before we go. He brought me a change of clothes, a pair of blue jeans, walking shoes, and a t-shirt. He said to take nothing. 
I changed out of my shower as fast as I could. I wanted every last minute to be with my family. They all cried. It was not until we were in the car on our way to the airport that I could let my own tears fall. Outside the car window, I saw the broken walls of my city. I saw the war-stricken poverty of my people. I felt our fear. Afghani goes and he meets up with these other people who've worked for the USA agencies, the governmental agencies, who've all paid $25,000 US to be trafficked out of the country. That is the international trafficking rate, if anyone is curious. Um, and they, they end up in Dubai, they end up in Serbia, and then finally they are in Sweden. And each of them, have, they have, they've been given three passports. And so I want to read um, from the flight into Sweden. The flight was short, only two hours. In that time, we decided in a frenzy of whispered conversations that it would be best if we destroyed all three of our passports. We would enter Sweden as refugees of war. We would slowly build lives in this place where none of us had ever been. How do three men each destroy three passports? What was our best option? We could think of only one plan. We had to take turns going to the bathroom during the flight. Each time we rip up two to three passport pages into tiny little pieces and flush them down the toilet. Our plane wasn't a great one. Our plan wasn't a great one. We took turns getting up, lining up, going to the bathroom again and again. People started giving us weird looks. No one else had an opportunity to use the bathroom. Even the flight attendants wondered whether we were all right. Yes, yes, we were all right. Still, we kept on lining up and flushing the toilet, and it was all getting very suspicious. When the captain announced that we were landing and told all of us to go to our seats, one of my friends whispered that he had not managed to destroy his third passport, the Spanish one. We could only feel sorry. The plane landed, and we entered an airport the size of a medium coffee shop. The flight crew and the other passengers were all wary of us, the airport staff sensed their wariness. They asked all the European passport holders to stand in one line. My friend, who had not managed to destroy the Spanish passport, went into that line. I and my other friend waited in a corner with no idea what to do next. When my friend's turn came to speak to the official, he was clearly nervous. Is this your passport? The official asked. No, he said. The official looked at the picture of him and said, if this is not your passport, is this your photo? I don't know who the passport belongs to, my friend answered. He was so nervous by now that he could not look at anyone. If this is not your passport, how did you get it? The official asked. The truth came spilling out in a jumble of a story that was filled with tears and stutters and regrets and the people he left behind in Afghanistan and the reasons why he had to leave, and how he didn't know what would happen next. The official stopped him and calmly called over another official who had already contacted the police. Soon enough, the border police arrived and took him to a small room off the main terminal. Now all the passengers were looking at us in our corner. The suspicion on their faces made us feel even more pressured, and I had a bad feeling. The friend, who, the friend with me bowed his head and he went over to one of the officials. He said simply, I don't have a passport. I was now hiding behind a table, crouching. I know they must have cameras. I know the airport is the size of a coffee shop. I'm 24, and I'm so scared that I'm hiding in view of everyone looking at me. A few of the border police came out of the small room to take my friend away. Meanwhile, everyone is looking at me and I'm still hiding. Then I heard on the loudspeakers, the person hiding behind the table in the corner, come out. <laughs> they spoke in English, and I understood every word. I had to come out. Now, when we hear about the refugee story, we don't hear so often about the differences in that story, but Afghan's story is a great example of this, because Afghan ends up at a five-star resort in Sweden. This enterprising resort owner has decided to work with the Swedish government to turn this five-star resort into a refugee camp for people all over the world. And so Afghanistan ends up there. And while Afghanistan, Afghani is there, he keeps asking for a certificate of humanity. Then people think, 
he's crazy. So they sent him to the camp psychologist, and this is where I will end the reading. The camp psychologist got to know me well. At first, she was unsure about my mental health. She was baffled by my request for a certificate of my humanity. She asked me if I believed I was human. I said, of course, but other people weren't so sure. So I needed help proving my humanity. She then offered to provide me with such proof. But why, I asked her, what is the difference between you and me? How come you are more human than me, in a position to observe and certify my humanity? After all, do we not have the same blood, the same makeup, the same dreams even? Why are you more successful in your humanity than I am in mine? I told her that if she was going to give me a certificate of my humanity, she would have to show me hers first. I had to know who had given her the authority to determine human certification. I had been a human in my country, a human in a war. I told the psychologist that the war was a war on terrorism, but I was not a terrorist. I told her about the warlords, the communists, the religious thinkers, and the powerful humanitarians all doing battle in my country. I told her that I was just a human being and that many of the humans in my country hate war. We were victims of war, to be specific. Of the Americans and the Russians and their allies and their battle for power over people. She listened to me and took notes. Finally, she said, you are not sick. She was then the first in a long time to say, thank you. Please come back to talk to me so that I can learn from you. Afghani's search for his certificate of humanity is why Afghani ended up in Minnesota. One day, he put up a big post on Facebook. One day, an activist from Minneapolis read the post and said, where are you and who are you? And Afghani shares his story. And this person says, my god. We have to connect you with your USAID supervisor, and you have to come to America. And of all of the America you can come to, you should come to Minnesota. Because while we are not high up for diversity, we have more refugees per capita than any other state in the nation. And so Afghani works here, lives here. His family hopes to come here. The thing about memories is this. When I started writing, I thought, I would only do the work of writing my own memories. But then I discovered, as I grew older, that each and every single one of us, we're not only the things that we have lived through, we are the memories bequeathed to us, handed down to us. In fact, memory is often our greatest inheritances. I learned that to be a writer, to work in a language, you have to not only open that language up for your own story, but others around the world. That is a responsibility that I learned from all of my teachers, all of the people, like all of you in this room. A language has work to do. A language is a gift that we can offer those who need it. I want to thank you for the incredible work you do, for this incredible time that we live in, for the memories that you are making, for all of the students under your care, for your colleagues, for our community. Thank you. Um, at this time, at this time, on my tone, Michael are kind enough to have microphones, and I want to give you all an opportunity to speak with me, to speak to me. I, I had no talk, you know, I don't write things down when I give talks, um, but I'm really here to be with you. And so if you have questions for me, please raise your hand or even comments, and there's microphones here. We can engage and have a conversation. Thank you. What would be useful for the work you all do is really the heart of this question, right? The heart of this moment. I say this to my high schoolers when I visit and I give talks. If you have an opportunity to ask questions and you don't, you can't go on social media after this and say, it sucked. It's just not how this works. Um, uh, right here, my tongue. Um, first, uh, just to say thank you. You're 
just from the moment you start to feel tears coming to my eyes. Um, my question is for heritage speakers who don't have necessarily the language models at home because maybe their parents are quiet, um, to encourage them to reach into their home language and develop biliteracy skills. I don't want it to feel like patronizing and I don't want them to feel like they have less somehow. Um, I wonder if you've, in, like, in your experience with families and, um, and kids, when you inspire them to learn their home languages and keep them alive and um, keep them connected and in, in use, um, I feel like when I try to explain, like, my ancestors are Norwegian. I don't know how to put fish in a barrel. <laughs> um, but it does feel kind of like it, it gets removed really quickly, yeah. only to maybe one or two generations. So I just wonder advice that you would have. You know, as a, as a teacher of writing, and I teach people to find stories wherever they are. My father, because he's a great song poet, he tells me that the job of the artist, that the job of the teacher is to harvest from the garden of life. And the thing we're harvesting is meaning. That is always what we're looking for. We're looking to build meaningful, purposeful individuals who feel they have a value, who believe in that value to a bigger community, regardless of where they come from. And so for me, it is always a question of beauty. Because the thing that people don't expect when we're dealing particularly with difference is that there is beauty to be found, beauty to be discovered, beauty to be shared. And so I always say, what is something very beautiful from your home? It could be an object, it could be a word, whatever it is. Make it as easy and accessible for you as possible. And I always tell them, because this is so important, right? You cannot tell a great story with just one word. But that one word allows for that one sentence. That one sentence invites the other. Five sentences, you get a paragraph, right? Four paragraphs, you get a page. Everything is built, and everything has to be built from where you are. Learning is something that has to be tailor-made for the individual. And so it is always a search for beauty. And you know what I found across the board in all of my last decade of teaching, across institutions and grade levels? There is beauty in every life. And when we invite that beauty to enter into our classrooms and the space that we share together, the space becomes immediately more beautiful. You know? And there is nothing wrong with an overabundance of beauty, people. You know? But I think so often when we're talking about heritage language speakers and we're talking about communities, often marginalized communities in a bigger mainstream, we forget that the thing we're looking to build and to discover first is the beauty. That is, that is the gift of the one human being, what we can offer another. And so I make it really beautiful. And then when, I, when, when it is very, very shiny and beautiful, then we can begin to talk about the light and the shadows. We can begin to travel further and deeper into different directions. Um, wherever appropriate for your learner. But the truth is, it is the search for meaning that we're asking for, asking of ourselves and asking of our students. And I always um, bring examples to the classroom because a relationship is a relationship because when there's a call, there's a response, right? And so I, I, I try to bring in as many elements of, a, of myself as I can to the table. My grandmother, whose wisdom I still live by, likes to say that all of life is just moments strong on the thread of time. It is too hard to give your all to all of life. That's simply too big. But if you give your all to one moment, you open up the possibility for the next. And that's what I do. And that's what I tell my students to do. Everything they do for me is only a picture of them in time, a picture that they will work on, that they will refine, that will change and transform along the process. That's all it is. Grades and comments, these things are nothing more than a response to that picture in time. Because the lay homecomer, for those of you who've read it, is, is a family memoir. This is a collective refugee memoir. There are different photos of me taken at different points of my life. We are a body of growing work, we as educators and our students. And then the most critical thing, you got to give everybody more than one chance, right? This is why when I talk, I say to people, if I don't quite understand a question, I say, can you tell it, can you ask me one more time? Because I deserve more than one chance to try to get at the heart of what you're asking. Can you give it to me one more time in a different way? 
And that's how we teach others, particularly learners, how to give themselves more than one chance. Because we're all bound to fail at some point on the journey. But it is about lifting somebody higher when they fall. Is that useful? Um, first of all, thank you for your beautiful words. Um, and I had a quick question. I think it was in your book, the, oh, thanks. <laughs> your book, The Song Poet, where you talked about a time when you chose not to speak um, with your teachers. And just wondering how I can best support my students um, with selective mutism and then also the classroom teachers that work with them. That is a wonderful question. So the song poet, I don't know, I'll tell you all, you're the first group to hear it. It was originally, it's the Minnesota's one book, one read right now. So any of you can do download it for free. If you go to a St. Paul Public Library site, that's on December 9th, it'll culminate in a big keynote where I'll be speaking, but anybody within the borders of the state can download the book for free right now. Um, and it's also gonna emerge as a main stage production by the Minnesota Opera in the fall of 2023. It will be the first time a Hmong story debuts um, in an opera form, but on that platform as well. Um, which then gets to this, this question that you're asking me. From the age of seven until the age of 27, I didn't talk. I didn't talk to be heard. In the St. Paul Public Schools, every time a teacher asked me a question, I just nod my head and do the thumbs up. And that was enough because I went to big urban schools filled with kids who needed more support than me. Um, at Carleton College, one of my professors, Professor Rich Kaiser, he said to me, you know that you are being selfish. You're absorbing knowledge. You're here to become a producer of it, but you're just absorbing it. First time, I had to pause. And yet those words, although they were having me question myself, um, they couldn't get the words out of me. Now I'll back up for a little bit. I stopped talking because my mother, when we first came to America, my mother and I went to Kmart and she was looking for light bulbs. And she didn't know the word, so she kept on pointing to the ceiling and she kept on asking for the thing that makes the world shiny. But my mother has a thick accent. And in America, not a lot of people have a great deal of patience for accents. And so as my mom is struggling, the clerk is tapping on the counter. The faster the tapping, the harder it becomes for my mother to speak. But my mother, who was then 25 years old, and I thought the most beautiful woman in the world, because um, she had no wrinkles. That was the standard of beauty for me. Uh, she, but my dad also said that she was the most courageous because Laos was the most heavily bombed nation in the world per capita. Only the world didn't know it. And whenever the bombs rained down, my mother would walk. When old men and women ran, she walked her chin parallel to the ground. My mother, who was incredibly brave because after I was born, because Hmong people only got food three days a week, my mother chose to feed my sister and me. And so she, she was pregnant six times, all little boys, and she had six miscarriages because she couldn't sustain the pregnancies inside. And how every time my mother had a miscarriage, all the aunties would say, so much blood loss. We don't know if she's going to make it. And yet each time my mother walked through that rectangle of a door reaching for me, my mother, the most courageous person I knew in the world, asking for light bulbs, and the clerk walks away. And we wait. 15 minutes pass on the round clock, and nobody comes back. And my mother bows her head for the very first time in my conscious life, and she looks at her feet. And I know that the person she is ashamed of, ashamed to be in front of, is me. And so I decide at the age of seven that if we live in a world that did not need to hear my mother and my father, because at work people are always saying, B, you're here to talk to the machines, not us then surely this world didn't need to hear me either, so I became a selective mute. I always thought that one day if I was gonna speak again, it would come from the strongest part of me, perhaps this thing that was inside of me that I didn't know, this powerful source of strength, this superpower. April 10, 2008, The Late Homecomer comes out and I have a book launch. It is a book launch and I'm thinking my cousins will come because there's cake. <laughs> but I'm thinking that's it. I walk into a room at Concordia St. Paul and the room is full of some 300 teachers. Many of them look like many of you in this room right here right now. Teachers who had taught students like me across the years. Some of them were my own teachers. And at a book launch you have to talk, you know. 
And so I got up three times to try to talk, and I couldn't do it. And finally, after the third try, I cut off all my hair so there was nowhere to hide. My father gets up from the back of the room, and he walks toward me. And these are the words that, that somehow pull the, pull the air out of my breath, and somehow words came into the world. He said, May nai, if Hmong tears can reincarnate, we would rain the world with our sorrow, but they cannot. They can only green the mountains of Pumbia if you speak. If the winds of humanity blow, then maybe our lives are not lost. My father, who has incredibly rough hands because he spent most of his life in America as a machinist, the Hmong gesture of love is when you sweep somebody's hair away from their face. And whenever he sweeps the hair away from my face, it hurts because his hands are so rough. But I try not to show him that it hurts because he might stop. My father puts out his hand because my hand's trembling so much, the soft hands of a writer. And I put my hand on top of his, and he says to me, from hardness, you give birth to gentleness. And he walks back, and I stand up there. And you know, when the, that voice emerged, it was the softest place. It came from the softest part of me, the part that couldn't grow hard because it had been watered by my tears all of those years. Even now, you can hear the tremble in my voice. You can hear the tears that I don't unleash into the world escape in my words. Sometimes it takes a great long time for those words to come into the world. The point, though, is that I had teachers all along the way who did not know my voice, but who saw the little girl inside of them, and who every time I made a mistake would put a squiggly line and a big old question mark. The question was, what do you mean to say? You send a little girl chasing after meaning. You create a writer in the process. And it took the writing to get the words out into the world. That was my particular truth. But all of those years that I spent listening, they have not been wasted. I've heard my teachers. I've heard the people around me. And they have shaped and feel who I am today. So thank you for all of those words that you spoke into the space of who I would become. Sometimes it just takes a long time. Did I answer your question? I don't know where we are in time. Um, oh, it's 10.03. I'm sorry, people. I tend to run with the questions because I feel like they're just an opportunity to, for us to engage on what matters. And so it's such a gift. I want to thank you for your time. I wish you all a wonderful conference. And thank you for giving me a reason to come to the River Center this year.